Chapter seven, making work distinctively your own. Only you can make distinctive work. I once read that beloved painter Vincent van Gogh was clumsy and inept, which would never have occurred to me. The author cited Vincent as an example of difficulties a gallery faced when a painter's brushstrokes varied from painting to painting. Really? Van Gogh sold one painting in his lifetime. Methodical brushstrokes probably wouldn't have changed his sales portfolio much. It's doubtful with his reputation that he would have been inclined to play by those rules anyway. What we do know is that Van Gogh paintings are distinctive. We recognize his work as soon as we see it. In this chapter, we consider the issue of distinctiveness, where it comes from and how to cultivate it, because you're the only one who can make your work distinctive. No one else can be in charge. <clears throat> Focus, alignment, and goals. What's so special about being distinctive? What are we seeking as artists, if not ways to marry meaningful work to enjoyable work? Too often we make pieces without personal significance and unfortunately not distinctive at all. Being distinctive isn't easy. One class rejected the word unique as a cliche, but go ahead, try it on for size by asking what is unique about your particular take on a subject or process. The Musée d'Orsay in Paris exhibited a show of early Impressionist paintings, an identical street scene interpreted by a dozen artists, each of whom experimented with this new painting style, Impressionism. Painters who really got Impressionism painted wonderful paintings. Ones who sort of liked the idea or were friends with Monet at the time, not so hot. Their paintings looked forced. It wasn't a good fit for everyone. Loads of textile artists do shibori dyeing or print dye with a silk screen. There are thousands of watercolor artists, oil painters, and potters in the world. Technique itself isn't distinctive. It's what the artist does with it that makes the process art. And what about artists who got there first? Monet was the master impressionist. Nancy Crow perfected improvisational piecing. Jan Myers Newberry uses shibori masterfully in her quilts. Trying to better a master is not for the faint-hearted. The point is, what are you going to do to make a process distinctively your own? What matters to you? We're building on everything we've talked about so far. First, get comfortable with writing. Next, engage the rebel artist to protect studio time. Then limit the power of the committee. Choose to use what's on hand so precious time isn't wasted running to the store. Make time for what you want to do and take time to do it well. You'll feel pretty good at this point because you recognize what alignment means as a personal attribute. What you love to do and what you're good at doing and what you need to do to improve. Now consider exploring content by writing about what matters to you. It's important to point out here that what matters to you is what matters to you. It doesn't have to be world peace or gun control, poverty or religion, unless that's where your passion is. It can be flowers or beauty or color, form and line. Passion is not predictable, it's personal. It might help to limit your focus. Artists need experimentation and playtime. That's how a distinctive style coalesces. It takes time to distill neutral process into unique visual voice. Choosing to focus attention and energy deliberately while limiting techniques or materials speeds up the process. Focusing is good. So why are we intimidated by it? Maybe feeling intimidated is related to an underlying fear that concentrating efforts in one place will result in leaving other opportunities behind, that somehow the choice is forever. But focusing on one area doesn't preclude ever being interested in others. It just means that for some length of time, you've chosen intentionally to work within limits. Align preferences, skill sets, and goals. There's a lot of bad art in the world. There are bad paintings and there are bad quilts. 
Having said this, it's still true. The bad work was worth doing because the bottom line is the value of the process. What you learn from engaging with materials and what that making defines, refines, and reshapes at the core of your soul is what's important. Don Henley nailed it when he wrote, you never see a hearse with a luggage rack. You may never achieve anything on the order of a Nancy Crow quilt or a Paul Gauguin painting. We are not all visionaries, but you have a right to create distinctive, satisfying work. It's a worthy goal. You'll be more likely to succeed if you align your preferences, skill sets, and goals with what you care about, because it's what you care about that is going to make your work distinctive. The fourth, fifth, and sixth chakras. Spiritual theorist Caroline Mace wrote about ideas manifest in her book, Sacred Contracts. She used chakras, the energy centers in our bodies, to describe symbolically what happens when artists get new ideas. The fourth, fifth, and sixth chakras secure commitment to new creative ideas. They are referred to as the heart, throat, and third eye chakras. The third eye chakra is considered the seat of wisdom in the body. Think of it as being connected to the grand universal ether where it retrieves ideas for your consideration. Once an idea lodges in your head, it floats there. You think about it, analyze. Easy to do, hard to do, worth it, you're thinking. Now imagine the idea drifting down through your body where it lodges in your heart. A new analysis begins. Would you enjoy the idea? Could you love it? Does your heart feel it's worth attempting? The heart chakra either embraces an idea or not. If there isn't enough literal heart energy surrounding the idea, it will probably dissolve and never achieve fruition. We all know what that feels like. If the heart chakra embraces the idea, think of it as a quickening pulse, the energy between the heart and the mind is palpable. You know that feeling of excitement when you can't wait to get started and literally see what the idea will look like when it manifests. Once the heart and mind are excitedly riffing on the idea, the throat chakra engages. You speak your idea into the universe. Speaking, fifth chakra, is commitment. You can think about an idea and love it, but the idea probably won't be realized unless you talk about it, usually by describing it to someone you know. Once you begin talking, you are figuring, planning, devising. These are solid steps to seeing the idea manifest as a reality. Now consider a downside to what I'm describing, which is speaking too soon. Speaking before an idea gains the support of both the head and the heart can drain energy. You've already talked it to death. The energy is gone. We all know people who talk, 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 and never do anything. They consistently drain ideas and speed them to a certain creative death by talking when they should just be still. It's a good idea to keep ideas to yourself at this early stage, which is why writing comes in handy once again. Writing harnesses ideas within your reach, where they can continue to solidify, but it protects them from the scrutiny of others too early in your process. So don't rush to share ideas with the world. Ponder them until your heart and your head are clamoring in unison. When the song is eventually sung, it will be solid and ready. Heart, mind, and voice will be aligned, and then you can decide what to do next.